After a month has passed, I notice an update on the Joy of Creation game. I'm curious as to what this might be, so I quickly open up the game and check it out. I see that the game now has a story mode, and I start watching some videos of people playing through it. The story mode looks like it will offer a completely different experience from the original game mode, and I'm curious to see what's in store for the player. I see that the different levels in the story mode are the bedroom, living room, office, basement, and attic. It makes sense that they're using the different rooms in the house for the level design, and I get the feeling that this will make for an interesting and unique playing experience. I learned that I'll be playing as Scott Cawthon's family in the story mode, and each level will focus on a different family member, including Nick when he was a kid in the bedroom level the mother-wife in the living room level, and Scott himself in the office, basement, and attic levels. The story behind this sounds intriguing, and it'll be interesting to see how the family got attacked by their creations and survived the nights at Fazbear's Fright. I sit down and watch the gameplay videos of all the levels in the story mode. Seeing how the levels have been designed and how the different family members interact and work together to survive each night is fascinating. It's clear that a lot of care and attention has been put into making this mode both challenging and exciting, with each level offering a unique and distinct experience. As I watch the gameplay videos of each of the levels, I can't help but feel a tingling sense of excitement building within me. It's clear that the game has been crafted with careful attention to detail and meticulous planning, making each level a unique and challenging experience. The family dynamic and teamwork aspect also adds a layer of intrigue and complexity, making for a truly dynamic and engaging gameplay experience. I continue to sit and watch the gameplay videos, mesmerized by the carefully crafted levels and intricate family dynamics. It looks like a true testament to the creativity and hard work of Scott Cawthon, and I'm eager to get into the game and explore the different rooms and levels for myself. I start playing the game for myself and manage to successfully complete all the levels in only three tries. A testament to my skill and determination. Despite the difficulty, it was incredibly fun and rewarding. The layout and design of the rooms were intricate and complex, keeping on my toes and requiring me to think and strategize in order to survive. It was a truly engaging and enjoyable gaming experience. I begin to think back to last month when I found myself in the Joy of Creation house, playing the endless mode where I had to collect five objects within one minute. Now that I'm playing the updated story mode, I'm reminded of this experience and how intense and challenging it really was. I recall how I had barely managed to find all five of the items before the timer ran out, and how the animatronics had relentlessly pursued me throughout the entire ordeal. I start playing the game for myself and manage to successfully complete all the levels in only three tries, a testament to my skill and determination. Despite the difficulty, it was incredibly fun and rewarding. The layout and design of the rooms were intricate and complex, keeping on my toes and requiring me to think and strategize in order to survive. It was a truly engaging and enjoyable gaming experience. I begin to think back to last month when I found myself in the Joy of Creation house, playing the endless mode where I had to collect five objects within one minute. Now that I'm playing the updated story mode, I'm reminded of this experience and how intense and challenging it really was. I recall how I had barely managed to find all five of the items before the timer ran out and how the animatronics had relentlessly pursued me throughout the entire ordeal. As I play through the story mode, I suddenly start imagining myself returning to the Joy of Creation house again and playing the game in body cam first-person shooter style. I imagine it as if the Depart prototype game that I was starring in had merged with the FNAF fan universe, and I was living out the thrilling experience of playing the Joy of Creation game in real life. It would be an incredible and intense crossover experience, putting me directly in the center of the action, and all the suspense and horrors that come along with it. After contemplating the idea of going back to the Joy of Creation house to play the story mode in a body cam first-person shooter mode, I make the decision to actually do it. I decide to go back tomorrow night at 8 p.m. sharp, ready to embark on this unsettling and terrifying journey once again. The next night at exactly 8 p.m. sharp, I prepare all of my equipment and gear, ready to embark on my return journey to the Joy of Creation house. I make sure to have my body cam, my gun, and my flashlight all ready to go, knowing that I'll need every single one of these items to defend myself against the animatronics and their attacks. It's time to go back and see if I can beat the story mode in a first-person shooter style this time around. I don sew my military uniform and put on my tactical gloves, grabbing extra strong ammo and even a military helmet for added protection. I'm taking no chances this time, and I'm prepared to face whatever comes my way when I return to the Joy of Creation house. 
After quickly eating a sandwich to replenish my energy and strength, I head out to my military jeep and begin the drive to the Joy of Creation house. I'm ready to tackle this challenge head on, and I'm determined to come out on top this time around. I arrive at the Joy of Creation house and park my military jeep right outside the front door. I take a moment to take in the scene before stepping out of the vehicle and heading inside the house. I'm ready to face whatever horrors await me here, ready to overcome any obstacle that stands in my way. Let's do this. I skip the bedroom level of the story mode since the protagonist for that level is Nick when he was a kid, and I'm an adult in the real world. So instead, I head directly to the living room level, where the wife is the protagonist. Let's see what lies in wait for me here. As I enter the living room from the door on the left, I immediately notice the presence of the TV that acts as a camera monitor for Ignited Freddy and Ignited Foxy. I see that there is a pause button, which can be used to freeze the animatronics in place, and I take note of the fact that the buttons for Bonnie and Chica do not work. I also see that Bonnie will make a creepy groaning sound that will give away his location, and Chica will appear at the window to scare and stun me if I move when she is there. I take a moment to study and assess the situation. I see that the TVs are an essential tool for survival in this first-person shooter-style horror scenario. I'll need to be vigilant and quick on my feet if I want to avoid being caught off guard by the animatronics. I also need to be careful to move carefully and strategically so as not to stir up Chica when she appears at the window, otherwise I'll be left stunned and vulnerable. I need to tread lightly and act deliberately to make it through this level alive. I notice that both Ignited Freddy and Ignited Foxy start moving on the TV, and I hit the pause button for Ignited Freddy to focus on Ignited Foxy. I make Ignited Foxy move further first, giving myself some breathing room to deal with one animatronic at a time. It's a clever way to manage the pacing and increase my chances of survival, and I'm glad I spotted this opportunity to make the situation more manageable. I see Ignited Foxy getting close to the door on the left side of the room and run to hide behind it, just in time to evade his line of sight. I duck down behind the door and hold my breath, hoping that he'll pass by without spotting me. I hold my breath as I peek out from behind the door and see Ignited Foxy walk into the room and scan around for me. After a moment, he turns around and walks back through the door, completely missing me hidden back here. I exhale in relief, thrilled to have gotten through that little encounter unscathed. Now that I've successfully managed to evade Ignited Foxy earlier, I decide to switch up the positioning of Freddy and Foxy when I pause the television. This time, I freeze Foxy in place and allow Freddy to come first since he's closest in the room. This tactic will give me time to deal with only one animatronic at a, ti a time, and hopefully make the situation more manageable. I quickly run over to the door on the right side of the room. The one that I know Freddy is going to walk through to come in. I carefully hide behind it, hoping to stay out of view when he enters the living room. I hear the audible footsteps of Freddy as he enters the living room and scans around, slowly moving towards the door I'm hiding behind. I hold my breath, trying to stay as still as possible and keep out of view. I exhale in relief as Freddy walks back through the door, having still failed to spot me in my hiding spot. I wait for a moment to make sure that he's truly gone before slowly peeking out from behind the door to see the TV screen once more. I peek out from behind the door to see what's going on on the TV, hoping that Ignited Foxy hasn't moved too close to the door on the left side of the room while I was hiding. After doing this technique with Freddy and Foxy for two hours, my senses are suddenly startled by loud groaning sound coming from the doorway behind the couch. My body goes stiff as I quickly turn to face the doorway, my gun raised and ready to fire at any moment. I approach the doorway and cautiously look through the keyhole, seeing Ignited Bonnie in the distance. I can feel my heart pounding as I stare into his unblinking eyes. I'm filled with dread and fear as I quickly recall the part about his creepy groaning sound that indicates when he's moving, knowing that he's likely coming straight for me now. I continue to monitor Foxy and Freddy on the TV, but I now divert much more of my attention to watching the front door and checking through the keyhole at Ignited Bonnie's location, making sure that he doesn't catch me off Guardian. I keep my gun raised, ready to fire at any moment if he suddenly moves past that doorway and charges directly at me. I check on Bonnie a fifth time, and my heart starts to race as I notice his red eye also looking through the keyhole on the other side of the door. This means that he is about to come inside and he's coming for me. It's only a matter of time before he's right here, and I'm not sure if my gun will be enough to stop him. I grit my teeth and prepare myself for the worst. 
I quickly move in front of the couch and aim my gun directly at the doorway, ready to shoot at Bonnie the very moment he steps foot in the room. I know that my life depends on those split-second reactions, and I don't have time to hesitate. I've got to be completely focused and attentive in this tense and potentially lethal situation. I see Bonnie open the double doors and squeeze off two shots, hitting him in the head and making him stumble back and fall over, stunned. I let out a sigh of relief as I realize I acted quickly enough to stop his advance, but I know that the threat isn't over yet. I take a moment to gather myself before checking back over the TV screen. I resume checking over the TV screen, but I'm quickly startled once more by an ominous sound that rings out in the air. I freeze and instinctively look over at the window. I immediately see Chica at the window, and I accidentally move, immediately causing her to teleport in front of me. In a split second, I manage to fire off three shots, stunning her before she can shriek. The intense burst of gunfire is enough to leave her powers so weak that she essentially powers down, leaving her defenseless and disabled. I let out another sigh of relief as I see that the clock strikes 6 a.m., indicating the end of the level and opening the way to the office level. I let out a deep breath, relieved to have survived the living room level and all its challenges. I quickly prepare myself for the next level and make my way to the office, knowing that there's likely even more terror and suspense waiting for me there. I enter the office and immediately notice the computer system. An old camera system with three individual monitors, each displaying a live feed from a, from a camera outside each of the three entrances to the room. I see the computer screen is displaying a live feed of the area outside of the main office door, and I immediately scan the other two monitors to see what the other two cameras are displaying. I look at the individual monitors and see that the monitor on the left is showing the closet area, while the one on the right is displaying the outdoor area by the window. I quickly scan the live feeds to make sure there are no anomalies or hostile animatronics lurking around either area. I remember that in the game, I have to keep an eye on Foxy in the monitors which will make him go away, and he'll growl and scrape at the door of the entrance he's at, indicating that he's there. Also for Freddy, I'll have to flash him with the flash attachment on my gun ten times in order to make him go away. Chica will try to get into the office through the hole in the wall next to the double door, and I'll have to find her three cupcakes hiding around the room, or outside the entrances. Finally, for Bonnie, he'll make the same creepy groaning sound, but I can't look at him directly, which would result in him screaming and breaking the cameras. I'll have to ignore him and make him leave, but this will be much more difficult since he is so clever. He'll also try to get inside the office as well, making him potentially the most dangerous enemy so far. For the first half of the night, I'll have to deal with Foxy and Freddy. They will be the first animatronic threats I have to manage, and they'll require different approaches to keep at bay. I remember that with Foxy, I need to keep an eye on him in the monitors to make sure he goes away and doesn't enter the room, while with Freddy, I need to repeatedly flash him with my gun's flashlight attachment in order to drive him away. I see Foxy appear on the left entrance monitor, letting out a low growl as he scans around the closet area. I quickly switch monitors to keep an eye on him, making sure to make eye contact with him in the monitor so he doesn't try to sneak inside. I maintain eye contact with Foxy through the monitor causing him to get annoyed and eventually go away. This successfully fends him off for the time being, but I know that he will likely return again, and I'll have to stay on guard. I switch back to the monitor that displays the doorway outside of the main office entry, and I scan the area closely for any threats or potential animatronics about to charge inside. I observe Freddy on the center monitor, waiting for him to begin his slow march across the area towards the office. I remember that I have to continuously flash Freddy with my gun's flashlight attachment several times in order to make him go away and not attempt to enter the office. I switch over to the flashlight attachment on my gun and point it directly at Freddy on the monitor, then quickly and repeatedly flashing him with bright light as he slowly approaches the office. It's a bit tedious, but I keep this up for roughly 10 flashes, making Freddy get annoyed and head back the way he came. At 3 a.m., Chica appears at the wall hole in front of the office, writhing and trying to squeeze her way inside. I immediately remember that I need to find three of her cupcakes hidden around the room, or outside the entrances, or she'll come inside. I begin to thoroughly search all around the office and the nearby vicinity, looking for any hiding spots that might conceal her treats. I search around the office and manage to find a cupcake in one of the drawers. This is the first of Chica's cupcakes that I've found, and I still need to find two more. 
I continue searching the vicinity around the office for more cupcakes, paying extra attention to any possible hiding spots or dark corners that might conceal more of her treats. I spot the second cupcake in the small trash bin, realizing that this would be a likely place for Chica to stash one of her treats away. I'm now down to just one more cupcake left to find, so I redouble my efforts and search everywhere I can imagine for the last treat. I finally catch a lucky break and manage to find the final cupcake hidden behind the Chica poster. With all three treats found, Chica is satisfied and she goes back out through the hole in the wall, and the clock strikes 4 a.m., signaling the beginning of the second half of the night. As the clock strikes 4 a.m., I hear the telltale groaning noise coming from the doorway ahead. I immediately recognize this sound as something I heard about in the game, and now know that Bonnie is coming. According to the rules, I have to ignore him entirely to make him go away. But knowing how cunning and unpredictable he is, I need to carefully tread the line of ignoring him, while keeping an eye on him just in case he tries to trick me. I take a moment to prepare myself for Bonnie's arrival, taking a breath and focusing my attention on the doorway. I know that I must not make direct eye contact with him or acknowledge him in any way, or this will provoke him to advance and charge into the office. Instead, I will simply keep a close watch on his position in the doorway while also scanning around the office for any other potential threats that may be lurking about. I continue my vigil at the doorway, keeping my eyes fixed on Bonnie as he stands in the doorway. I try not to move, speak, or do anything else that could possibly attract his attention and elicit his attack. I also keep a vigilant eye and ear tuned for any other animatronics as it's always possible that they could take advantage of the distraction presented by Bonnie and try to make their move on me. With proper strategy and caution, I managed to fend off all of the animatronics successfully surviving the second half of the night and making it all the way to 6 a.m. With the sun soon rising and light filling the office, I let out a sigh of relief and collapsed to the floor, utterly exhausted, but grateful to have survived another night. I take a moment to catch my breath and recover from the tense experience of the previous night, then prepare myself for the upcoming challenge of the basement level. I know it will be even more difficult than the living room level, and I'll face even more dangerous animatronics that will test my skills and strategies. I quickly grab my equipment and make my way down into the basement, fully ready to take on whatever horrors await me down there. I head down into the basement bathroom. Realizing that this is the same location that Scott wakes up at after being knocked out in the game. I remember from playing the game that this is the starting point of the next level. But I also know that I'm in much more serious trouble deep inside this basement level. With much more powerful animatronic foes waiting to pounce on me. I observe the desk with the various monitors on it, which display eerie and cryptic messages. The first message reads, You are awake. You exist to let us out. Let us out open the way or burn with the rest of them. This message is soon replaced with a series of multiple eyes that flash on screen briefly, before the screens are consumed by static once more. I can't help but feel a sense of dread and intrigue as I observe the ominous warnings and images flashing across the many monitors. Upon looking around the basement, I observe that a metal gate blocking off the basement door, which leads to the hallway above. I'm essentially trapped down here, and can't escape to the way I came which immediately raises alarm bells in my head as I recall that these animatronics were already hostile and aggressive back in the office level. I know I'm in serious trouble now, trapped here with them in this confined space below ground. I try to jiggle the gate, finding it firmly locked and unable to budge. As I'm doing this, I hear an eerie girl's laughter echo around the basement, sending a chill down my spine. Then, the strangest of all, I get the hallucination message. Don't come close, come back which is extremely confusing and unnerving. It's as though this hallucination is warning me to stay away, but also urging me towards it. I can't help but feel that something terrible is waiting for me just around the corner. I make my way back down the stairs into the area of the monitors, and instantly, my body freezes and my heart skips a beat when I see that a menacing metallic figure is standing right next to the monitors. It stands tall and menacing, like the type of thing you would expect to see in a sci-fi horror movie. The sight is undeniably unsettling, and it sends a primal chill of terror down my spine. I try to get my bearings and observe the metal figure standing near the monitors without getting too close and triggering an attack. From an angled perspective, I see that it looks a lot like an animatronic endoskeleton, but it's completely motionless, as if it doesn't even register that I'm present. The unnatural sight is both unsettling and unnerving, filling me with even more dread and anticipation of what might come next. 
I take the chance to try to sneak past the metallic figure and quietly slip back into the basement bathroom. Realizing that this may have been the warning message was referring to, I quickly close and lock the bathroom door, hoping that this might at least provide a temporary refuge from the animatronics until I can figure out what to do next. I step out of the bathroom to see that the metallic figure is gone and the monitors now display a new message. We come from the fire, but our bodies need shape. Bring his creations to us to ignite our flame. Along with this dark message, more eyes then appear on the monitors before returning to static. I quickly look around the basement and see that the layout does, in fact, look a bit different. It's like the entire basement has slightly shifted and reshaped itself, adding to the unsettling sense of uncertainty and unease. I notice that the layout of the basement has indeed changed, and now includes a multitude of things that had not been here before. There are some new party tables and decorations, as well as some additional items that further reinforce the dark and twisted vibe of this level. But then I see that the endoskeleton from earlier has now moved to by the lit-up furnace, which instantly grabs my attention. The sight of the endoskeleton now positioned next to the flames of the furnace, with a sinister message on the monitors, fills me with a deep sense of unease and apprehension. I quickly scan the new message on the monitors, which has displayed three items that need to be put in the furnace. A cupcake, guitar, and Foxy's hook. However, I also note the warning to stay a certain distance from the endoskeleton by the furnace. This makes the process exponentially more challenging, as it means I'll have to carefully balance avoiding the endoskeleton with obtaining the three items for the furnace and actually delivering them there. I know that one misstep could result in disaster. I successfully locate Foxy's hook in a bin, Bonnie's guitar in a locker by the furnace, and, after a bit of searching, the cupcake behind the Chica poster by the stairs. I managed to obtain all three items without triggering the endoskeleton to attack. However, I am still very aware of its presence, and take steps to ensure that it remains distant and out of my way. I quickly make my way to the furnace and successfully place all three items inside, lighting them ablaze. I breathe a sigh of relief as I successfully ignite the three items in the furnace, and quickly head back to the basement bathroom to progress through the level. With the endoskeleton now back in its original position, I close and lock the bathroom door, once again hoping for a safe and stable refuge from the animatronics. I then take a moment to carefully scan the monitors for any additional messages and potential hazards that lie ahead. Just as I'm about to slip back into the bathroom and close and lock the door again, I get another hallucination message. You are not safe, go back! Along with the message, an even more terrifying endoskeleton, with vivid red eyes, briefly flashes on the monitors before disappearing again. This message and the sight of the endoskeleton is enough to make me freeze in my tracks for a moment, the primal fear of being hunted and attacked, threatening to take over. My instinct is to rush back into the safety of the bathroom, but the hallucination gives me pause. I stand in the doorway between the bathroom and the rest of the basement level. My primal instincts urge me to rush back into the safety of the bathroom and shut and lock the door right away. But my rational mind prompts me to consider the hallucination and the potential warning it could be conveying. For a few seconds, I'm frozen in a stalemate between these conflicting emotions, torn between the instinct to hide and the need to explore and proceed. My vision suddenly fades and comes back with an eerie red hue. I instantly recognize this as another hallucination, and the ominous color prompts my instinctive fear response to become even more intense. A surge of pure adrenaline floods through my body, and I'm instantly on alert for any sign of danger as my instincts scream at me to get to safety. As my vision starts to clear, I hear a loud stomping that sounds like running, approaching me at supersonic speed. The sound is intensely alarming, filling me with an instant sense of panic and dread. I quickly try to locate where the sound is coming from, scanning the basement in search of the source of the noise. My heart jumps into my throat as the terrifying endoskeleton suddenly lunges at me, charging up at me with a speed faster than anything I've ever seen. It's bearing down on me with unnatural speed, its red eyes burning into my soul and its jaw opening wide in a malevolent grin. I don't hesitate for a moment and quickly draw my gun, firing off four shots directly into its head, causing it to stumble back and power down. A wave of relief floods my system as the animatronic's attack is thwarted, but I know that I'm not yet safe. I take a moment to observe the design of the endoskeleton that just attempted to attack me. I'm no expert, but I am able to recognize the animatronic's god endoskeleton as more advanced compared to some of the other animatronics I've seen. It's not quite as intricate as the withered or toy endoskeletons, 
but it's clearly made with more modern technology. Its intricate design suggests that it's been specifically built for hunting purposes, or perhaps other, more sinister ones. I inspect the endoskeleton's face and recall the vivid and frightening sight of the glowing red eyes. Now that I'm able to take a closer look, I note the similarities between the endoskeleton's facial design and Bonnie's. Based on this, I deduce that this could indeed be Bonnie's endoskeleton. However, one question emerges. What happened to the parts of his suit he had before? Was it purposefully removed, or did some kind of accident cause his suit to be completely destroyed? Not trusting the seemingly incapacitated endoskeleton, I quickly make my way back into the bathroom and lock the door behind me, eager to regain the safety of the space. I let out a breath and lean against the wall, taking a moment to process what's happened, while also keeping my guard up just in case something else should happen. I glance around the basement again, noticing the fresh layout, with more random items and props scattered about. Then, I take notice of the gate between the two sections of the basement, as well as the monitors, showing yet another creepy and cryptic message. Many shapes all similar, but different. All keeping us in here with you. The one he calls Michael, in the stories he formed. Find the key to fit the lock, avoid the ones lost to the fire. His kindred to fill your desires. Before I can decipher the bizarre message, I notice the drawings. The drawings with the numbers that, in combination, look like a code of some sort. I take a closer look at the drawings themselves, each portraying a different animatronic Bonnie. One, Chica, two, Foxy, three, and Freddy, four. They seem to be numbered in a specific order, and given the message on the monitor, there may be a rhyme or reason to it. I notice a code written on the wall reading 9632, which could be the pin code for the keypad to the gate. Assuming that is indeed the case, I immediately walk up to the gate and enter the combination of numbers into the keypad. I input the numbers into the keypad, and the gate unlatches with a metallic click. With the gate now open, I cautiously step through the threshold and enter the new section of the basement, ready to investigate what lies ahead. After carefully stepping through the open gate, I look around the newly discovered section of the basement, taking in the surroundings. The area is significantly larger than the first layer of the basement, and filled with more prop decorations, party tables, and random items. My eyes immediately scan the area upon entering the new section, taking in its size and layout. However, in the process of doing so, I notice another endoskeleton in the distance, standing in a dimly lit corner. The endoskeleton is indeed a different design, and appears to be missing its eyes. This makes it instantly stand out and fill me with uneasiness, as it seems like something is not exactly right about this particular animatronic. My spine instantly shivers as yet another hallucination message pops up. Don't look away. Don't turn your back. The message seems to be warning me about the endoskeleton standing in the distance, and the implication is that it may move when I'm not looking. My heart skips a beat as my fears are confirmed, and a wave of fear threatens to overtake me. I glance away from the endoskeleton for a second, trying to test the message's warning, and immediately regret it. In that second, the endo has not only gotten closer, but it's also now reaching out toward me with its hand. I react instantly, instinctively pulling out my gun and firing off three quick shots, aiming for its head. The bullets strike the endo, causing it to stumble back into the darkness of the corner. I keep my firearm ready and raised, as I'm fully expecting another attack as soon as the endo recovers. However, to my surprise, the endo doesn't get back up again, and after a few moments of remaining motionless, it finally collapses. I quickly walk over to the endoskeleton, aiming my firearm directly at its head, and proceed to put two more rounds into it. I'm not taking chances. I'm filled with a sense of relief as the endo finally collapses and ceases to move. But the lingering fear in the question still lingers. Whose endoskeleton is this? After considering the situation for a brief moment, I recall that one of the drawings from the monitor displayed Freddy's silhouette alongside the number four, suggesting that this could indeed be Freddy's endoskeleton. I proceed to enter the 25 of the pin pad for the furnace, which seems to successfully open it. I then exit the new layer of the basement, closing and locking the gate behind me, and head back to the bathroom, ready to investigate the second layer of the basement. I continue to carefully search the new layer of the basement, and soon find a key on the floor near the door to the bathroom. It appears to be a key to open or unlock something specific, and if I'm correct in my assumptions, it may be linked to the code on the monitor. I quickly make my way back into the bathroom and once again lock the door behind me, feeling the safety and security that the space offers. 
I then glance at the key, realizing that, based on the message I saw on the monitor, there's a code that this key will probably unlock as well. As I return back from the bathroom, I notice that there has been a massive change to the layout of the basement. Instead of the previous labyrinth-like structure, it's now a long, straight, and dark passageway, with only a few scattered props and decorations to fill the space. This changes everything, as now I'm left with little cover or hiding places in this new design. With the new layout making my progress significantly more dangerous, I immediately adopt a defensive stance as I walk down the long, dark path, aiming my firearm ahead and focusing only on what lies before me. Every step is taken with extreme caution and vigilance, scanning the space for any potential threats or hazards. All of a sudden, another hallucination message flashes, reading, Keep going, don't look back. The message is accompanied by the silhouette of a new endoskeleton, which only has a single eye in its socket, and a creepy giggle. <laughs> my muscles tense and my adrenaline spikes as I instinctively begin to scan the area. Something in the ceiling above me must have activated, as the lights have switched to a bright red, flooding the space with eerie lighting. I have a strong feeling that things are about to get really bad. With all of my senses on high alert, I quicken my walking pace down the dark passageway, keeping my eyes locked forward, not daring to take even a single glance back. The hallway is eerily silent and empty, only the sound of my footsteps echoing off the walls. However, the atmosphere is thick with an ominous and sinister atmosphere, and I constantly feel like I'm being watched. I can hear the sound of loud stomping from behind me, growing louder and closer with every moment. I know what this means, and I don't waste a second. I spin around just as an endoskeleton charges toward me, trying to tackle me to the ground. The endoskeleton charges at me with unbelievable speed, aiming to tackle me and knock me to the ground. I react instantly, spinning around just in time to dodge the attack. The endoskeleton continues its charge, closing the gap between us again, this time attempting to grab me. I instinctively react and fire off a quick shot at the endoskeleton, which causes the animatronic to stumble back a few feet. It seems to slow down briefly as it's struck by the bullet, but it quickly regains its footing and quickly speeds back up to me, attempting to strike me again. I fire off two more shots, slowing the animatronic down even further, but again, the endoskeleton persists in its charge and is only a few feet away now. I fire off four more shots, one of which strikes the endoskeleton in the eye, causing it to flinch and stagger back seeming to stutter in its advance. However, the attack doesn't end, and the animatronic quickly regains its footing and rushes forward yet again, closing the distance once more. I fire off a final shot, aiming directly for its head. My final shot lands right on target, slamming into the endoskeleton's head and knocking it back, causing the animatronic to fall back, collapsing to the ground. Finally, after what seemed like an endless barrage, the animatronic lay still, not moving or acting any longer. I carefully approach the endoskeleton, keeping my firearm aimed to ensure that it's truly deceased. After examining the endoskeleton more closely, I notice that the ears are indeed shaped like those of Foxy, and that this endo is in fact the one belonging to the Fox animatronic. It further supports the idea that the hallucination messages may indeed be hinting at specific animatronics, as Foxy was listed as three in the drawings I saw on the monitor. I rush through the doorway, relieved to find myself back inside the bathroom, feeling the safety and security that the space offers. I let out a sigh of relief, wiping away the sweat on my forehead with the back of my hand. However, after I take a moment to calm down, it suddenly occurs to me that, given the layout change that occurred while I was in the other sector of the basement, the bathroom may not be as safe as I once thought it was. As I walk back through the door, I notice that the layout has returned to the one I saw previously with the monitors on the wall revealing the drawing of Chica with a note labeled 2 and a hallucination message reading. Don't look back. The message is a stark reminder of the danger I recently faced, and I'm certainly not taking my safety for granted, even when inside the seemingly safe sanctuary of the bathroom. I read the message on the monitors, and it sends a shiver of fear down my spine. It sounds like a direct reference to the animatronics and their purpose. And if the endoskeletons I'm now surrounded by are indeed the ones described in the message, then their intended purpose becomes clear. They exist to terrorize and destroy. However, the hallucination message also includes the ominous He Remains warning, which only increases my sense of danger. The layout then changes yet again, revealing multiple endoskeletons, and two of them appear to be the ones from the hallucination message, which were described as attacking when getting too close. One on the left side and the other on the right. 
I have a strong feeling that things are about to escalate very quickly and very dangerously as the endoskeletons now blocking my path begin to slowly approach. I take a quick look around, and my eyes instantly lock onto more of the eyeless endoskeletons, which were mentioned in the hallucination message as moving when I'm not looking at them. It's clear that what's happening now is the fulfillment of the message's warning, as the endoskeletons are now everywhere, and there's nowhere I can go to avoid their sight. I realize that I'm now trapped in this nightmare, with nowhere left to run. I quickly raise my firearm, aiming it directly at the nearest of the eyeless endoskeletons, and fire off multiple rounds in its direction. This is where things are gonna get really messy. Suddenly, the endoskeletons begin to rush at me from all sides, aiming to attack. I quickly respond by firing off a few shots, aiming to keep them at a distance and hopefully drive them back. However, the Endos have other ideas, and despite my shooting, they continue to advance and close the gap, their bodies taking the hits until they finally reach me. I fire off shot after shot, aiming for the heads of the Endoskeletons, and as the bullets slam into their heads, the Endoskeletons quickly go down one by one. I keep firing relentlessly, and a few moments later, the endoskeletons lying around me form a small pile of broken, lifeless metal. I take one last look around the basement, now quiet and silent apart from the sounds of my breathing. The sight of the endoskeletons forming a pile of scrap metal sends a shiver of fear down my spine, but this fear quickly turns into a sense of elation as I see that the basement door is open, signaling that my trial is completed. I slowly start to walk toward the door, relieved but exhausted, ready to finally escape this nightmare. As I exit the basement, I take one last look back and close the door behind me, feeling a huge weight lifted and a sense of relief rushing through me. I take a deep breath, preparing myself for what I know will be the final and most difficult challenge yet, the attic. With my gun reloaded, I proceed into the attic, ready to face my final challenge. As I enter, I expect to see more of the familiar horror. I slowly step into the attic, immediately noticing the monitor with the two switches on the wall. It seems to be some sort of control panel, but the exact purpose of the two switches remains unclear. As I look around the space, I also see the two doorways behind the chair, leading to two corridors which are blocked by dark curtains. The layout of the attic is very similar to that of the first two layers of the basement, but the addition of the curtain corridors and controls panel makes it far more unsettling and ominous. I see the switches for the two doorways and pull each of them, causing the two doors to close simultaneously. The two corridors behind the curtain doorways are now blocked and sealed off. Seeing how the corridors are not necessary to seal off just yet, as the night hasn't started yet, I proceed to reopen the two doorways which I previously closed. The doorways are now open, and the pathways behind them are visible again. I approach the monitor seeing that it's showing a live feed of each of the three tiers of the house, starting with the basement, where I just came from. The video feed for evils, and I'm able to switch between them by pressing the appropriate buttons. As I click back on the camera button, I'm instantly startled by something I was not at all expecting to see. As I look at the monitor, I suddenly see a huge, sinister-looking animatronic staring back at the camera. I instantly recognize this animatronic as the final boss, named Creation, who looks like a more twisted version of Freddy. He not only has Freddy's head, but also has four arms and one of Foxy's hooks mounted to one of the arms. I instantly realize that this is my toughest fight yet. I quickly pull the switch on the left side of the monitor, which has an electric symbol under it, and look at the monitor to see a bright light flash from the camera, causing Creation to back up out of view. This confirms my suspicion that the switch controls the flash beacon on the camera, and that it must be used to keep Creation from making his way up to the attic. I take a deep breath, realizing what I need to do next. I now pull the other switch, which changes the cameras to the attic's cameras behind me, allowing me to observe the area behind me. This is going to be crucial, as I'll need to be aware of the movement of animatronics in this space. I focus my attention on using the flash beacon to keep Creation at bay for the majority of the time but I occasionally check the attic's cameras to see if any danger is approaching. When I look at the left camera, I notice an endoskeleton running toward the doorway, moving quickly toward me. I quickly turn around, shut the door just in time, preventing it from entering the attic. I can hear the immense loud stomping sound approaching the closed door, and the speed at which it's coming is truly astounding, sounding like a train rushing forward. This is clearly the next challenge I will have to face, and it looks like it's about to get extremely intense. 
I'm suddenly startled by a loud thud against the door, as the endo that was charging toward the door suddenly knocks itself out by running into it, causing the door to rattle and shake from the momentum of the impact. This is good news, as it means that the next animatronic will not be entering the attic just yet, providing me with more time to focus on keeping creation away. I quickly switch back to the main cameras and spot creation in the living room, realizing that he has now advanced from the basement due to the fact that the endo distracted him for too long. However, I'm not going to let this turn into a major issue, and I quickly pull the first switch once again, shining a bright light at creation to get him to move back. As I continue to keep an eye on the living room, suddenly notice another endoskeleton approaching the door on the right, running towards the doorway. The endoskeleton is moving at a fast pace, and I assume it's about to charge into the attic, much like the previous one that I just thwarted. Not taking any chances, I quickly shut the door on the right, preventing the endoskeleton from entering the attic and further complicating my situation. This means that I can once again focus entirely on keeping creation contained in the living room and preventing him from advancing any further. The endoskeleton continues to approach the door until it finally slams into it with a loud thud, causing the door to rattle and shake. This confirms that the endo was indeed rushing ahead at full speed, and I feel a massive sense of relief knowing that my maneuver was successful in preventing it from entering the attic. As I continue to watch creation and the two doorways and prevent them from advancing, I notice that each of the spaces has an unsettling red glow and is starting to slowly catch on fire. This realization quickly sinks in and I know that I have a very limited time to keep this situation under control, as the flames will surely eventually reach the attic. I quickly take a deep breath as it's clear that the final hour is approaching and things are about to become extremely intense. As the clock hits 5 a.m., the attic catches fire flooding the space with bright flames and bathing everything in that ominous red light. This signals that the final hour has arrived and 6 a.m. is quickly approaching, meaning things are about to get even worse and that I must be extremely vigilant. I'm suddenly startled as one of the endoskeletons makes a prize jump scare, causing me to flinch and quickly fire my gun in a reflexive response. The bullet hits the endo's head, causing its head to fall off and the endo to crash to the ground. Before I could fully recover from the surprise of the unexpected encounter, the other endo from the doorway begins to rush towards me, moving incredibly fast. Faster than I expected. I jump in front of the doorway and fire off a shot, killing the endo before it has the chance to enter the attic. However, this also confirms that the remaining animatronics are now at their quickest, most aggressive state, and I brace myself for the toughest fight of my existence. I hear the clock strike 6 a.m., the hour at which all of the horror that I've been experiencing throughout the night will come to an end and I'll be able to escape. However, the house is now completely engulfed in flames, and I realize that I have mere seconds to complete my escape from this nightmarish night. I rush out of the attic and into the living room, remembering that the last animatronic I must face is Creation, who is waiting in the living room. I get my gun ready and brace myself for a final confrontation with the final boss, firing six shots into Creation's head. Creation stumbles back and screams, clearly feeling immense pain from the six shots I fired into its head with my gun. This confirms that the battle against Creation is finally over, and I have only one thing left to do to complete my escape. I run towards the front door and pull it open, feeling the cold, fresh air of morning wash over me, as the final hours of my horror-filled, nightmarish night finally come to an end. I get to my military jeep and quickly reverse it to a safe distance from the house, which is now engulfed in flames. I take one last look back at the house where I was trapped all night, relieved that my terrible ordeal has finally come to an end, and that I finally escaped the living nightmare. I stand in shock as I feel a powerful whoosh of air. And after looking around, I see that the fire has been completely extinguished, and the house now appears completely normal again, as if nothing ever happened. Still feeling shaky and stunned after the events of the last few hours, I proceed to drive back to the main road, heading back home, hoping that this nightmarish experience has finally come to an end for good. Despite the nightmarishly scary events that played out, I did really have a lot of fun playing the game in real life. The sense of immersion and realism of the whole experience was amazing, and the challenge and tension was definitely something I won't soon forget. I arrive back at home, feeling a sense of relief and accomplishment. I take a deep breath, knowing that the night is finally over, 
and I can get some much needed rest after this ordeal. I step inside my home, shutting the door behind me, and I sigh with relief, knowing that I finally survived, and that the nightmare is finally over. I take a moment to grab a drink of water and something to eat, then I head upstairs, where I plug in my body cam to charge and export the footage to my computer. I feel like it might not be the most pleasant thing to have to rewatch, but after all the trouble I went through to get the footage, I simply can't not upload it. As I lay down to get some much needed rest after the wild and intense night I've just witnessed, I also begin to reflect on the many lessons I learned throughout this terrifying experience. As I lay down to sleep, I can't help but reflect on the many lessons I've learned throughout this nightmare of a night. The key to surviving a night like this is to keep a level head, use careful strategy, don't hesitate to use whatever you can in your environment to your advantage, and never, under any circumstances, abandon hope, because hope is what gets you through the worst nights and allows you to reach the light of morning.